everybody. Welcome to lecture two, where we're going to really be focusing in on life. Um, if you haven't watched it yet, please go back and watch lecture one, which goes like way big. And we try to talk about like kind of the history of the universe, the formation of galaxies and stars, including our solar system and our planet, and kind of the little first bit of Earth history. Today, you can see by our title, we're actually going to be talking about a huge amount of Earth's history. Nearly 88% of Earth's history is going to be in this lecture today. Um, something that's kind of fun for you to consider in this vertebrate paleontology course is the history of fossils of animals, for the most part, is in that last 12%, almost all of it, completely. So even at the scale of the universe, you know, there's Earth in the last four and a half billion years of the 13.7 since the formation of the universe, as far as we can tell. And then even when you get to the Earth, it's 88% of the Earth's history before you even get to what we might call a really rich fossil record. That doesn't mean there's not fossils we're going to talk about today from all these other parts of Earth history, um, but it's a really kind of stunning number to think about that even on Earth, it takes 88% of the time since it formed to get to a really good fossil record. And so when we talk about the Earth um, in the last lecture, we kind of went through outer space, did a lot of outer space stuff. So like I said, I encourage you to go watch that. But we kind of got through the first eon. There are four eons in Earth's history, the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, and the Phanerozoic. And that last bit, the Phanerozoic, that's that 12%. It's almost all this class is going to be about. Um, and last lecture, we got through the Hadean. So this is our summary slide for the Hadean, talking about some of the features um, of the planet and our best ideas right now of when they formed, including just how old the Earth itself really is, about 4.57 billion years old, just a hair under how old we think the sun is, about 4.6 billion years old. And so that's our solar system. And so in that next eon, though, which is a pretty long time, right? You can see here, this is like one and a half billion years of time. You can think of that as like 1,500 million <laughs> years of time is this period called the Archean. And so what we learned about the Archean last time was that star over there on the left-hand side, again, as always, our timeline will be on the left-hand side, that star just above the 4 billion years ago mark or 4,000 million years ago mark, that's when we first had our first evidence of sedimentary rocks and actually some chemical indications that geologists and um, scientists who study early life think they can see like metabolic products, chemical signatures of metabolic products in the rock. So Earth might have had some kinds of probably single-celled life as old as 4 billion years ago. What's really interesting is that we can take the DNA from living organisms, so anim not animals, I'm sorry, organisms like bacteria, archaea, and even animals like us, which are eukaryotes, um, but the bacteria is what I'm really talking about here, and get a kind of a genetic estimate for how old divergences are among different lineages of bacteria. And those dates actually turn back to estimates that are pretty close to 4 billion years ago. So it's pretty reasonable to suspect that after that heavy bombardment, which ended at the end of the Hadean when Earth is getting pummeled by pieces of the solar system still forming, um, life might have popped up on Earth really quite fast. And I'm not going to get into it in this lecture, and it's a super, super worthwhile topic, and there's a lot you could learn if you really wanted to. There are extremely good schemes, some of them complementary, some of them not, but still really good and grounded ideas for how life could have started from inorganic materials here on Earth. We know things like liquid water are around. We know there's lots of organic molecules. And so somehow about 4 billion years ago, maybe up to about 3.5 billion years ago, we know for sure, um, life would have formed. And so all you need to have to have life form is some sort of encapsulation. So you guys think of like a cell with a cell wall. So there's an inside and an outside. And so it contains space for chemical reactions to take place. There's a lot of ways scientists can simulate and get it um, those types of processes on different kinds of surfaces, clay surfaces in hot springs. There's all kinds of really interesting science there that I really wish we could talk about. I'm not going to, since this is a vertebrate paleontology class and we have to get to those animals. But all you have to do is have a self-sustaining chemical reaction that's kind of separate from its own environment. Okay. And then if that reaction reproduces itself in some way, if it splits, you now have something like life and that life is reproducing. And basically, once that starts, that's kind of the ball game, because a lot of the simplest forms of single-celled life, bacteria and things like that, that's what they are. They're encapsulated, reproducing cellular machinery. They just do what they do, and they reproduce themselves. Natural selection then has something to act on. Some of them do better than others. They survive, they survive, they survive. They eat their neighbors, whatever. And that's what life is. And once life is present, which we definitely know it's present by 3.5 billion years ago, you're going to see, as we move forward in this class, we're off to the races. But there's really interesting questions, and, and including some very non-scientific and sometimes really hostile ideas about how it's not possible for life to start 
from inorganic nothing. There has to be some extra thing that makes life different. And I don't think that's really a fair assessment of what we understand. I think there's a few different ways we could expect that are reasonable that self-sustaining chemical reactions would start. And then if you give the earth billions and billions of years, you're going to get things like redwood trees and human beings and, you know, dinosaurs. That's really something. What we can say in this class, because we're focused on fossils, is that 3.5 billion years ago, there's absolutely uh, evidence of life living on this planet. And so we talked about this in the last lecture, so I won't talk about it again. There are trace fossils that are some of the best first evidence we had of life uh, in our study of ancient life. And these are stromatolites, so evidence of layers of single-celled organisms living their lives, getting covered in sediment, swiggling up again, getting covered in sediment again. These layers preserve their habitats. It's not really them, but it's a trace of their presence. And we see those kind of things living today in places like Australia. Stromatolites still can be found in the world. You can go observe them. Living stromatolites, which are covered in single-celled organism communities, look like these fossils. There are also some really exciting body fossils that are, I'm sorry, I should say potential body fossils that could be from early single-celled organisms that are also around three and a half billion years old. So whether it's 4 billion, whether it's 3.5 billion, it's definitely by 3.5 billion, that's when life kind of starts on this planet. And that life is single cellular. And so now we're going to get into more of the biology of life, the phylogeny of life. So what you're looking at now is an evolutionary tree. Um, there's a bunch of living organisms up there at the top. So a bacteria, uh, an archaean, um, and then a couple different eukaryotes. You guys are eukaryotes. Um, plants are eukaryotes. Fungi are eukaryotes. And animals are eukaryotes. We are eukaryotes. And these are the relationships. Um, some of these people kind of know off the top of their head, but I think it's worthwhile to take it in and look at it. Animals, our closest relatives on this phylogeny of five anyway, are fungi. So fungi and plants have a common ancestor to the exclusion of plants. Plants is sister to a clade that has fungi and animals. All those organisms, though, are eukaryotes. So you can see eukarya is a node that is labeled on that phylogeny. So we can call that node eukarya. And by definition, everything after that split counts as a eukaryote. Anything outside of that is not a eukaryote. And you can see, though, that even amongst single-celled organisms, it's not like there's eukaryotes and single-celled organisms. We share a more recent common ancestor with these organisms called archaeans than either one of us does to organisms called bacteria. That's what's really interesting. And so the common ancestor of all the current life on Earth, every bacterium, like you can think about it as like you and the E. coli you don't want to get, have a common ancestor. And we call that organism LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And so we know from things like fossils that LUCA had to have existed at least 3.5 billion years ago. But like I said in the last um, uh, lecture, in the last slide, um, there are estimates from divergences amongst different clades of living current right now bacteria that let us estimate that bacteria themselves have been around for almost 4 billion years. And then that would push that LUCA ancestor all the way back to about 4 billion years ago, right at the very beginning of the Archean. And what's really cool about that is, if you'll remember, there are geochemists who have think they have found signatures of metabolism in rocks that is at least that old. So no trace fossils, no body fossils, but chemistry that doesn't really make sense unless there's single-celled organisms or some other kind of thing. Mm. Uh, having a metabolism and working with inside the environment. It's very interesting. So that early part of the Archean, that's when life shows up. And there's our phylogeny of what we absolutely know from genetics and all kinds of other things, the phylogeny of the living organisms up here in the present. So that's a fun thing to think about. What we know, what's still to be discovered, what's still to be pinned down. <clears throat> I hinted at this a minute ago, but I think it's uh, worthwhile to kind of state again uh, we might not be quite ready in this class to have this conversation, but we're still going to talk about it here. In the modern way we talk about things, both archaeans and bacteria are called prokaryotes, and that's to set them apart from us, usually multicellular organisms called eukaryotes. Um, but it's not like those are two things, like you're one or the other. In an evolutionary context, eukaryotes have derived characters. We have things like a nucleus um, that keep us as a united monophyletic common ancestor with all of its ascendants, clade. So prokaryotes is a paraphyletic word. It's meant to describe um, these things kind of based on an absence, the things that they eukaryotes have that these animal organisms do not have. So it's a helpful like key uh, or helpful, sorry, term for some of these single cell organisms that they're prokaryotes, um, but that's not like an evolutionary word. Um, some of the prokaryotes are more closely related to us than others. So think about that. So we go back into the kind of like the earth history side of things, what's going on in the Archean. Life shows up 
and the beginning parts of the Archean. And then there's still a whole other billion years <laughs> of the Archean left to go. And some of the things we can learn about Earth history from this time are really coming from geology, uh, like kind of planetary scientists and geologists, and really chemists too. And so what we start to see is that starting about three and a half billion years ago and continuing for quite a long time is the oxygenation of <clears throat> Earth's surface. And so that is almost certainly first in bits and starts, but then very, very solidly because of the evolution of photosynthesis. Some organisms, and we know which organisms, cyanobacteria, so a kind of bacteria, evolve the ability to photosynthesize. They can get photons from the sun and set those up with really simple starting ingredients of water and carbon dioxide to run a cellular machinery inside their bodies to create sugars. They can feed themselves based off of sunlight. This is an insane and amazing biochemical evolution. It is super well studied. There are still so many outstanding questions. You might be surprised to know that like the photosynthesis you learn about in intro bio, you know, what a plant's doing, which we'll talk about in a second. That's a very derived version of photosynthesis. There's a lot of ways that we can reconstruct early versions of photosynthesis that are not clean and not very efficient, but would still function, still take photons from the sun and convert it into chemical energy that forms sugars. All that's very interesting. This is not microbiology. I'm not going to go into it too much farther. The important thing I care about for you guys, because we're eventually building towards vertebrate evolution, is that these bacteria evolve this amazing process. And besides making sugar for themselves, they have a waste product. And that waste product is molecular oxygen, O2. O2 is then something that's really, really, really powerful when it comes to running the cellular machinery of respiring organisms to do things like build ATP to power cellular function. So a byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. And right after life starts, you can see 3.5 billion years ago, right after life is definitely, definitely present, some of these cyanobacteria evolved and got their photosynthesis going. And we can really see that change. One of the ways we can get an idea that photosynthesis is happening is because suddenly there's a ton of oxygen in the environment that's having chemical reactions with the rocks, with the water, with the atmosphere, and that's measurable. So all throughout the Archean, there are these rocks. You can go around the world today and find outcrops of rocks from the Archean. And these formations, BIFs, banded iron formations, are everywhere. And what BIFs are, what those orange stripes are, are you can imagine that early Earth with those molten continents that are just cooling down, the first kind of normal processes of continents, you're finally getting erosion, you're finally getting sedimentation. It's still a soupy mess and the oceans are just full of iron. Remember that the earth, that's the single most, single plurality, most abundant element on, that this planet's made of is iron. And so there's tons and tons and tons of iron in the seawater. And so as these bacteria are living their lives and getting oxygen out of their systems after they make their sugars, that oxygen, as you know, is a really strong chemical. It really binds and it binds to iron. And so as oxygen binds to iron, they both form a compound that then falls out of the seawater and is deposited on the seafloor. And so all over the world, there are extremely huge deposits of iron ore that we humans like, can excavate. If you look at that picture, you can see the little earth movers moving around humongous amounts of iron, seams of iron all throughout Earth's rocks. For us to mine today, if we want to, so many of them are coming from the oxygenation of these early oceans. And that oxygen, when it comes out, doesn't go up into the atmosphere like it does now. It soaks and chemically attractive. It binds itself to iron, and then both of them fall out of the water. That oxygen is locked away in these BIFs, these banded iron formations. And so all throughout the Archean, all over the world, we see these BIFs. They're everywhere. The peak of this is about 2,500 years ago. Sorry, 2,500. Uh, 2.5 billion years ago, 2,500 million years ago, is kind of the peak of that oxygenation. What I think is really remarkable about this, I'll let you take a second to look at this graph. Um, that is a timeline. So that timeline is scaled. You can see 3.8 billion years at the bottom to the timeline over on the left. And you're seeing a red line and a green line that are two different estimates for the parcel, parcel pressure, the percentage of the atmosphere, so the gaseous atmosphere, that is oxygen. Today, about 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen. You might know most of our oxygen, most of our atmosphere is 
just inert nitrogen, but 21%, what you and I are very much used to for our metabolism, 21% is the current atmosphere. And if you follow those lines, they're different because they're different ways of estimating our idea. You can see there's times in Earth history, a couple hundred million years ago, it looks like, maybe three or 400 million years ago, is a high peak when oxygen seems like it's higher than it is today. But then if you go back farther than that, it very quickly is less. And so for almost, excuse me, almost all of Earth history, there's relatively little oxygen in the atmosphere. And so you can see oxygenation beginning at 3,500 3, million or 3.5 billion years ago. But that line isn't coming up from zero. It's staying zero. And that's because it literally takes a billion years for all that photosynthetic oxygen to bind with iron and then drop to the bottom to basically clean all that iron out of the seawater takes a billion years. And then even then, it takes a lot longer after that to start to accumulate in the atmosphere. So just because photosynthesis starts billions and billions of years ago, does it mean we get an oxygen atmosphere for a really long time? Because oxygen and iron are just binding together, and it takes a long time to clean out all of that iron before you start to get it accumulating in the atmosphere. So you can see at about 2.5 billion years ago, that line takes a turn, and suddenly oxygen does start to accumulate from the photosynthetic activities of single-celled organisms, it does start to accumulate in the atmosphere. And so that's kind of taking us to the end of the Archean, so that second eon. We saw the Hadean already. This is our summary slide for the Archean. Kind of important events for vertebrate paleontology that I would care you guys to just have in mind is that 3.95 billion years ago, the oldest sedimentary rocks and chemical signatures, probably, maybe, for life. Um, the end of the bombardment, right, is right then, at the end of, like, the pummeling we were taking as the Earth formed. By 3.5 billion years ago, no joke, definitely have life. There's trace fossils and body fossils and molecular estimates of divergence from living single-celled organisms and living eukaryotes absolutely lets us be really confident that the last universal common ancestor or LUCA for all life is in that early part of the Archean, so that's pretty confident. 3.5 billion years ago is when photosynthesis evolves and finally oxygen starts to accumulate in the Earth's systems. That oxygen does not stay there. It binds to iron and falls out of the ocean, but oxygen is being produced. Photosynthesis is happening. Okay, so now let's jump into the longest of Earth's eons, which is the Proterozoic. Sorry, one second. Sorry about that pause. All right, so as we head into the Proterozoic, you can see on that graph of the partial pressure of atmospheric oxygen that there finally is actually an increase. So from 3.5 billion to 2.5 billion, there's definitely oxygen getting pumped out by little single-celled organisms, but it's not really accumulating in the atmosphere. That changes as the start of the Proterozoic, and you can see we get an amazing growth from almost nothing, so a little bit of, like more than 0%, to about 1% of the atmosphere being oxygenated, or not being oxygenated, being oxygen, which is a big deal. And so that's called the Great Oxidation. And the Great Oxidation is 400 million years long, which is a hilarious amount of time. Um, from 2.4 billion to about 2 billion years ago is the Great Oxygenation event. One side effect of atmospheric oxygen is kind of like the magnetic field. Remember that when Earth first formed and we had a core and a mantle with you know, electroconductivity between them spinning around, the Earth generates basically a giant magnetic field. And that magnetic field protects us in a lot of ways from some of the sun's radiation and some of the particles that the sun gives off. Similarly, <clears throat> in the Proterozoic, as atmospheric oxygen starts to build up, you have this thing happen where sun's rays break up O2 molecules and you have these loose atoms of oxygen that sometimes bind with normal O2 oxygen to make O3 otherwise known as ozone. So we get the formation of an ozone layer. And so in a lot of ways, life on Earth is protected in the sense that it's in the oceans. And so the oceans, the water, the oceans do offer a lot of protection from the physical elements and some of the sun's radiation, but of course not all of it. Ozone building up and having like a shell of ozone around the planet changes a lot about what actually reaches the surface. Different ultraviolet rays that the sun gives off, some of which are really damaging to life, even at the cellular level, are blocked, especially UVB. That is really reduced. UVC, 
totally blocked almost. And so that's a big difference. Life on Earth can now be more exposed, maybe in shallower water. And of course, that's going to be a big deal much, much later in time when life starts to come up on land. And so this is another one of those things that's like, it's chemistry, it's a little bit about physics, but it's something I want you guys to think about because a metabolic process where some bacteria figured out how to make their own sugars leads to a waste product that is oxygen. Oxygen is not only something that's really effective for driving respiration and other cellular processes, but just because of what the sun is doing in its radiation, atmospheric oxygen is going to result in an ozone. And that ozone is going to be protective even more from kinds of radiation from the sun to let life flourish. So there's not directionality there, right? These things are all happenstance. But when they build up like this, really remarkable. A planet that's big, has an active surface, liquid water. It's got a magnetic field that protects it. Now it's got organisms that are producing oxygen. And that oxygen is producing an ozone layer because of what the sun is doing to that oxygen. Really, really, really cool. We can see how this happens. So we can see in the sediments that are preserved, geologists can tell us that shallow seas in the Proterozoic became oxygenated. After shallow seas, you know, had all their iron drop out and the waters themselves became oxygenated, it started to build up in the atmosphere. That's what you're seeing in that graph. But at this time, rocks that we get that formed in deeper oceans are still totally anoxic. There's not oxygen down there. So that's letting us know something, right? These photosynthetic organisms are in shallow seas, which of course makes sense because they need to have the sun's light hit them to do photosynthesis. And they're changing their environment. Life is now a part of the astronomical, geological, physical processes that are happening here. There's a bio component to the surface of our planet, especially once oxygen starts to build up. Super cool. Super cool. Something worth noting and totally out of left field for you guys to just witness and deal with is the fact that in the beginning of the Proterozoic, around 2.4 to 2.1 billion years ago, there's some evidence of the first occurrence of what geologists call snowball Earth. So snowball Earth, um, it's called snowball Earth because if you were flying around in space, Earth would probably look like a snowball. This is a time when there seems like there was maybe like a complete freezing of Earth's surface. So presumably then ice on the oceans and maybe massive glaciated continents, uh, land masses that are covered in ice. So this is a really interesting field of study. It's always really tough and really highly debated. There's climate modeling. There's hard empirical data from geologists to go out and look at rocks that are this old. There's lots of really cool evidence for Snowball Earth. And you can see there I wrote first Snowball Earth. There are other Snowball Earths later in Earth history we're going to talk about here in a minute that are have a lot of evidence behind them. And um, I don't need you to really do anything with this information. But I want you to think about the fact that you've now seen Earth in the Hadean as a giant, basically magma lava ball. And now here it is in the early Proterozoic. And the surface anyway is like potentially frozen completely. Pretty wild. But let's talk about what happened after that. So 1.8 billion years ago is the evolution of a clade that we are in. So of course we are life. And so LUCA is something that's important to us animals, us mammals, us humans, but we're also eukaryotes. <clears throat> and so what is a eukaryote? When do eukaryotes show up? Well, we can take all the DNA of the living eukaryotes. You could take a sunflower's DNA and a human's DNA and compare them and do estimates. And you can get ideas that Somewhere around two, maybe less than two billion years ago is the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. That's super cool. Some people think it's a little more than two billion years ago, but definitely by at least 1.8 billion years ago, you have eukaryotes. And so I wonder, what do you guys remember from intro bio? Like what is a eukaryote? And so eukaryotes usually are bigger cells than prokaryotic cells, like the actual size of the cells bigger. There's more organelles. There's more specialized capsules within a eukaryotic cell to carry out functions. Probably the biggest, most important thing that you definitely remember is that a eukaryotic cell has a nucleus that contains all the DNA. In a bacterium, there is a little genome and it's in a little plasma. It's in a little circle. Eukaryotes have all their DNA wrapped up in around chromatids that make chromosomes that are inside of a nucleus that are kind of safe and separate from like all the other cellular functions of a cell. So a eukaryote cell is a pretty evolved, pretty derived cell. And you could think about this. This is now at minimum 1.7 and probably really more realistically, at least 2 billion years of single cell life evolution to get to something like a eukaryotic cell. A humongous amount of time for these little improvements, these little adaptations that are manifesting themselves, some of which probably weren't successful at all and didn't lead to anything, 
to get to something like a eukaryotic cell. There's also two other things that some eukaryotic cells have. All eukaryotic cells definitely have this one thing uh, that are a pretty big deal. And so again, here's our phylogeny. Around 1.8 billion years ago is when we expect eukaryotic cells. Again, they're larger, they're more complex, there's DNA in the nucleus. They also have sex, meaning that they are trading their chromosomes. Bacteria also trade genetic information, but most eukaryotes do some sort of like shuffling of their own genomes to make like gametes, like genetically distinct, still derivative from the parent, but a different combination of genes that then they can share with each other to make a new organism, a new individual. That's not a clone of the parents. That's something in eukaryotes that's pretty cool. And so the thing I just said about how many billions of years, you know, a minimum of 1.7 and probably closer to 2 billion years of cellular evolution is present from Luca till, <clears throat> excuse me, the first eukaryotes. And so, so much of what runs a cell exists by this time. If you compare your genome to the genome of a banana, which is always the funny example, but you could take any plant and do this. So many of the cellular functions, the cellular mechanisms, you have the same kinds of genes doing the same kinds of things as it's happening in a tree or a flower. That seems crazy, but on a cellular level, you're both like high-end complicated cells, each individual cell anyway, when you compare them. So it's really not surprising that so much of your genome is shared with any plant because you have this shared history. It's amazing to me that we can look at genetics and genetics is such a powerful tool. And so it doesn't really matter about what the anatomy is saying or, you know, some uh, other line of evidence. You can just look at the fact that, like, why in the world do you and a plant have so much genetic material in common, if not for this shared heritage from before you diverged? Billions of years, that line going down from eukaryotes, that line contains what will be you and what will be sunflowers. That's pretty crazy, right? We don't usually think about these like really ancient splits. And I think it's worth spending a second on. The big, 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 big thing that makes eukaryotes really special, and probably the reason they're so big and complex compared to prokaryotic organisms, is because eukaryotes are like, sort of like hacking the system. Eukaryotic cells contain multiple other prokaryotic cells. Every single mitochondria in your cells <laughs> is a type of bacterium that a long time ago ended up inside the body of a eukaryote. You guys know this. It's called endosymbiosis. There's a reason we can sequence your DNA from your nucleus, but then we can also sequence your mitochondrial DNA. You have a mitochondrial genome that isn't human. It isn't mammal. It isn't even eukaryote. It's a bacterial line genome. You're Little mitochondria, when your cells divide, they reproduce themselves like bacteria and they split. You only inherit mitochondria from your mother because the gamete from a woman is a big egg, not a little sperm. And so the mitochondria are her mitochondria. You get your mom's mitochondria, not your dad's, because it's a whole nother, back then, cellular organism that has to be transmitted. So we may think of mitochondria as just another organelle, but it's not. It's an actual kind of bacterium that lives for now and forever endosymbiotically inside every single solitary one of your cells. And of course, what do mitochondria do? The powerhouse of the cell, they're producing things like ATP, these metabolic products that let your cells have so much more energy and do so many more things. So there's this moment in the proterozoic when some big prokaryotic cell takes in smaller prokaryotic cells as little workhorses. It's obviously giving them a safe place to live. They're providing energy. And then eventually that organism becomes what we were going to call eukaryotes. That's really wild. And I think everybody learns that in intro bio, but then they don't like really let it in and like think about what it really means. Another point I like to make uh, when talking about this period in Earth history is that the common ancestor of all archaea is now a little different there on your slide. And so animals there on the animals, I'm sorry, organisms on the left there that are diverging off are all in this group called archaea. <clears throat> but it's actually true that some Archaeans are more closely related to us eukaryotes than to other Archaeans that are more distantly related. And so just like prokaryotes as a category are paraphyletic relative to eukaryotes, some are closer to us. Even Archaeans are not one clade. Some Archaeans are more closely related to us eukaryotes than others. I just think that's wild. This is also stuff that we're only just now really getting to learn in the last decade, 20 years tops. <clears throat> 
a lot of this is new information. So it's just not stuff that was in the textbooks 10, 15 years ago. It's pretty cool. So yeah, archaea is paraphyletic relative to eukaryotes. And what's really fun is some organisms, some eukaryotic organisms actually have another example of endosymbiosis. Some of those cyanobacteria that are able to photosynthesize, the ones that are producing oxygen that builds up in the oceans and then builds up in the atmosphere, some of those cyanobacteria end up inside eukaryotic cells that lead to things called like plants. And so you guys say, oh, plants photosynthesize. Uh, Plants are giant organisms and they have chlorophyll with you know, chloroplasts with chlorophyll, but it's because they have those chloroplasts that are bacteria, that are cyanobacteria. It's those bacteria, cellular processes that run the photosynthesis and a plant is hosting millions and billions of them inside of its own body to do the photosynthesizing. That's crazy. A plant, if you sequence a plant's DNA, you can do its nuclear DNA. You can do its mitochondrial DNA. You can do its chloroplastic DNA. There's three genomes inside of a plant cell that have nothing to do with each other. Isn't that just crazy? So these examples of endosymbiosis are a really big deal. So you can see there, this is not scaled to our timeline there on the left. Common ancestor of all life sometime uh, is existing today. The LUCA is there kind of in that basal split. So you got your bacteria on the left and your archaea on the right and eukaryotes are coming out of that archaea. There's multiple examples from the Archean evolutionary tree where there were endosymbiotic events. Some bacteria came in and became mitochondria. That's helped Archean cells get really big. And some cyanobacteria that are oxygen producing photosynthesizers ended up inside the common ancestor of things that we now call like algae and plants. And so those are organisms that totally took advantage of that. So not only do they have mitochondria giving them ATP, they've got chloroplasts creating food and sugar, sugar for them to use. Plants are super wild, super cool. Animals do not have that. We only have the mitochondria. This is the time in Earth history, in the beginnings of the Proterozoic, when this thing is happening. And that's worth, in my book, you guys having a handle on. Other things that happen during the Proterozoic is we get these first fossils of organisms that we can identify as eukaryotes that are likely eukaryotes. You can see how old these are. That one's from Michigan, actually, uh, 2.1 billion years ago. It might be a bacterial colony. It might be early algae. It's really hard to say. There's this whole category of fossils people find. You can see how tall, that small they are. Those little scale bars there are 15 micrometers. They're really small. So acrotarchs are this category. Um, and some of them might be fungi. You know, we don't know. Some of them might be just some early eukaryote that's really hard to tell apart. You guys have heard of a lot of the single-celled eukaryotes before, if you've read like an old biology book. Any, any eukaryote that's still single-celled usually falls into this category of protus, which we don't use anymore. But these are fossils, like physical things you can find. They're showing you some anatomy. You can make some inferences. In the Proterozoic, there's eukaryotes around. We can know that from the DNA today. We can know that from the fossils we find in the rocks. Next thing I put on this list I think is just totally hilarious. From about 1.8 to 0.8 billion years ago, or from 1.8 to 1.8 billion to 800 million years ago, actual people, the paleontologists of the world, call the boring billion, because actually not a lot seems to be happening that we can measure, and it's such a long time. You can see that atmospheric oxygen stays relatively constant during that boring billion. It's being produced, it's being used, so it's being replaced, but still, it's like not going up or down. <laughs> Not a lot is happening during that boring billion, but we do see, you know, continued life diversifying. We get these kind of organisms. So proteroclatus is an algae that seems to be multicellular, cells stacked on top of each other. So at some point in these eukaryotic organisms, there's going to be evolutions of multicellularity. So not just one cell living its life, but cells working together in some ways. Maybe they're all doing the same thing. Maybe they do that for a while and then reproduce together. Some of them start to specialize in what they're doing at a cellular level. Really interesting. There's other uh, fossils from this time that are certainly fungi. So Orospheria is a multicellular fungus that we see in this period during the Boring Billion. So some of these multicellular eukaryotic organisms are really starting to show up, even though geochemically, it's a pretty straightforward billion years. I like to then <clears throat> transition when I'm teaching you guys to look at this eukaryote situation. So I'm going to not talk for a second and give you a minute to look at this phylogeny. This is a phylogeny of all 
kinds of eukaryotic lineages. So put the Archaeans and the bacteria out of your mind. These are the eukaryotes. Look at this phylogeny. What do you recognize? What do you not recognize? Take a second to check it out. So one thing we're always going to have happen in this class is that nodes, so common ancestors for different lineages when they meet, are going to have a blue circle. And so that's that common ancestor of eukarya, and that that it's also a taxon we call eukarya that gets put right there. And so everything after that split counts as a eukaryote. So those ferns and pines on the left, the octopus and the magpie on the right, everybody on this slide is a eukaryote. And then there's red tick marks. You're going to see those throughout this class. Those red tick marks represent synapomorphies, um, derived characters, evolutionary changes of some kind that then apply after the tick mark happens, they apply to everything after the tick mark. So you can think about it as going like linearly, like up the tree through time kind of thing. And so mitochondria, the endosymbiotic presence of a little prokaryote bacterium that became a mitochondria, that is a common feature of all eukaryotes and all eukaryotes who have mitochondria inherited that mitochondrian condition from that common ancestor. You can see there's another endosymbiotic event over there with the red and the green algaes and the plants, and that's chloroplasts. There's an asterisk there because there's actually kind of a bunch of times that photosynthetic organisms got their way into that. I'm going to say left-hand side of eukaryotes. It's not just there. It's more complicated than that. But again, this is vertebrate paleontology, and I'm not going to get distracted. It's very cool. Ask people who study plants if you want to know more. Here's some clades. Um, on the tree. And these are clades I think are not too uh, alien to you. So plant A over there on the left includes all those things. We got red algae over there, green algae over there, and then a monophyletic clade called plants, plant A. And there's a fern and a pine and a sunflower or a little balsam root, I should say. Over on the right, there's animalia. And so another thing that's going to be true in this class is that anytime a clade is like all caps, it applies to um, kind of vertebrates, what we're studying right now, trying to get to vertebrates. Because I want to show you other things, but not have you get too distracted by them. So vertebrates are eukaryans, and of course, vertebrates are animals. So those those have all capital letters. And so there's animals, there's plants. But look at all the other things on here. A lot of the eukaryotes that exist, a lot of the clades of eukaryotes are not plants and animals. There's plants, there's animals, and there's some other stuff. One thing that I think is super special, and I think a lot of times students maybe learn this, but they don't fully integrate it is how many times the single celled condition of life evolved into a multicellular condition. When you think of eukaryotes, you might think of mushrooms and animals and plants, and they're all multicellular. But in fact, between all of those clades, there's tons of single celled eukaryotes, animals that back in the day would have been or animals, organisms that back in the day would have been called protists. And so multicellularly evolved independently in red algae, and in the common ancestor of plants and green algae, which is really complicated, multicellularity evolved in brown algae. Look over there. That's a kelp. If any of you have ever been to California or any of the oceans, really, you've maybe seen giant brown algae, these kelps. They look so much like plants. Guess what? They're not plants. They're not even multicellular <clears throat> in the same way that plants are. They're an independent evolution of a giant photosynthetic organism that's multicellular. That's crazy. There's also multicellularity in fungi. And of course, the multicellularity that you are from the common ancestor of all animals. Animals, by definition, also are multicellular organisms. And so that's a wild thing to think about. Put yourself back in the Proterozoic. Tons of single celled organisms, tons of prokaryotes, increasingly more different kinds of eukaryotes. Almost everybody's still single cell. But all over the earth, different times, different places, and for different reasons, you're going to have eukaryotes evolving multicellularity. It happens in green algae, happens in red algae, it happens in brown algae. That's what we call kelps. It happens in fungi, it happens in animals. And actually, it happens in a bunch of these other clades too. And sometimes they just do it functionally. There's some things like slime molds that are single cellular, but then when they reproduce, they make giant superorganisms. They all fuse together. And then they stop being multicellular after that. So multicellularity is like not as special as you think and also like more common and more complex than you think. And I think that's something people don't think about very much. It's very cool. Okay. 
So now we've been looking at Earth's whole history there on the left for four and a half billion years, 4.57 billion years. Now we're going to zoom in because like I said, this class is about fossils, it's about paleontology, it's the Phanerozoic, that blue bar. And so now we're getting really close finally to that blue bar. We're making our way through the 88% of Earth history. That's the Hadean, the Archean, and the Proterozoic. And so if we zoom in there, you can see suddenly there's a lot more words. And some of these words are going to be really important to our class. So there's the Phanerozoic Eon on the left. Phanerozoic is broken up into three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And then those eras all have periods. The first period of the Phanerozoic Eon is also the first period of the Paleozoic Era, and that's called the Cambrian period. But increasingly, we're learning that the early evolution of animals, including the phylum that we are in, vertebrates are in, does extend back into the Proterozoic. There's a lot of really interesting things happening at the end of the Proterozoic that we're going to talk about. So there's that end. You can see it barely sticking up there. End of that boring billion, because I guess things are going to be a little less boring after 800 million years ago, getting towards the present. And so that first period kind of after that, I know it's a bit of a jump, um, from 720 to 635 million years ago is called the Cryogenian period. It is a cold period. There are two instances, two discrete intervals of time within the Cryogenian when paleontologists, to a degree, but really mostly geologists, are really comfortable with the fact that there were these snowball earth conditions. Again, just like two and change billion years ago, a time when the oceans were frozen and there were ice on the continents and the earth might have been pretty much white if you were to see it from space. One thing that's really cool is Pocatello. Outside of Pocatello, there's rocks that preserve some of these glacial strata from this time, from 700 some million years ago. So Pocatello actually has data to add to this interpretation of um, the cryogenic period, which is super cool. So I put these snowflakes on there. There's these two periods of glaciation. I mean, you can see there's 30 million years between them when, excuse me, when it looks like things kind of cleared up. Interesting. I don't have a lot to say about it. I'm going to put this up there for now. We're going to talk about snowball earths and kind of climate forcings and how different parameters on the Earth's surface will change the climate and how that affects life. We'll talk about that later when we get into like ice ages and the ice ages that absolutely did affect vertebrate evolution. These are kind of before... Uh, most animal clades show up, most vertebrate, anything is relevant. And so we're not going to focus on them. But again, I wanted to point out to you, this is now like a second and third time that we have good evidence for this snowball earth situation. And so earth is a very changing surface. Something that's very cool that paleontologists can tell us about is that before that first snowball earth, or I guess what was now, I guess we'd say the second snowball earth, the first snowball earth of the cryogenian, between the end of the boring billion and that first snowball in the cryogenian, we can see that cyanobacteria, photosynthesizing bacteria, are still the dominant photosynthesizers in the oceans. They're the ones doing the photosynthesis. They're the most abundant. Interestingly, between those two conditions of snowball earth, so who knows what's actually forcing anything to happen here. We could talk about that in person. I think it'd be better than me on this uh, YouTube video. Between those two snowball earths, there's actually really good evidence that rather than cyanobacteria, algae, so eukaryotes that are photosynthesizing, become the dominant photosynthesizers. Interesting. And there's also evidence for some animal groups like sponges. Sponges are really um, kind of straightforward, filter feeding, simple animals. And they're showing up in between those two snowball earths potentially for the first time. The way they construct their skeletons means their fossils are pretty interesting and easy to identify. And so between the two snowball earths, there's definitely forcing some change to this like very long-standing pattern of prokaryotic organisms running the oceans. We also see a spread of oxygen. And finally, a lot of the deep ocean gets oxygenated, especially after <clears throat> that third or second in the cryogenian or third in Earth history, snowball Earth. So finally, those deep oceans are getting oxygen that is stable and dissolved and there. And so more advanced, more higher demand cellular function life can go live in those deep ocean waters after this cryogenian series of snowball earths. Interesting, lots to talk about, but not today. Finally, we move into the last period of the Proterozoic, which is the Ediacaran. So this is from 635 to 539 million years ago. And this is where animal evolution absolutely takes off. We're gonna be talking about this a lot in class uh, next Tuesday. We have good fossils from the Ediacaran, not from very many places, places like in China, places in Australia that are showing us multicellular 
relatively complex animal life. We do not really understand much of what these animals are doing. We can make really simple inferences about filter feeding, sometimes about movement, sometimes about how they hold themselves into the sediment. But this is like suddenly out of nowhere, there's all this soft life. Everything in there is smushy. There's not hard parts as far as we can tell. The fossil conditions have to be really perfect to preserve them. So there's Ediacaran rocks all around the world. Only a little bit of those rocks actually preserve organisms that are soft tissue. Sponges, like I said, are a group of animals. Um, they're really, really, really relatively simple. They have these kind of like pieces that are cup shaped with a flagellum and that flagellum flaps and a whole sponge's body, which is what you're seeing there on the right, is kind of like a big barrel. And the organism brings water into the side of itself. And then with those flagella, pushes the water out the top. And there's special um, pieces of its anatomy on the inside there to catch food particles. So it's pushing food up through itself and sifting out the food for itself to eat. That's what a sponge literally looks like today. And what's really cool is that other image there on the left, that's a living organism. So coanoflagellates are living single-celled eukaryotic organisms that can occasionally get into aggregations and function like little sponges. So sponges aren't uh, the most helpful for understanding a lot of other animal life, but living organisms today can show us like how a single cell organisms working together can basically functionally make a multicellular animal. And we have multicellular animals today called sponges that really do that. So sponges are alive during this time. They were alive in the cryogenian as far as we can tell. We're starting to see other animal groups. Really mysterious though in the Ediacaran. Here's some of the fossils we get. You can see their impressions. I think you can see that there's definitely something interesting going on. Most of these taxa, we'll call them. Kimberella might be a mollusk. Dickinsonia, no one knows what it is, but we find a lot of them. You can see that there's levels of symmetry. There's levels of complexity. We don't know what they're doing. Nobody can tell you too much about these organisms, but they seem like they're probably animals. They're soft. They're rare to find. Doesn't mean they were rare when they were alive. So something's happening in the Ediacaran. And that's all pretty new science. The last 30 or 40 years is when the Ediacaran became something people really studied and got to know. So this is like getting into um, animal dominated ecosystems on earth for the first time. And that's that's pretty cool. I wanna talk about the Ediacaran because we have really good evidence, again, that we'll talk about next Tuesday, that most of the major splits of animal phyla. So there are 35 at least phyla of animals, things like arthropods represented by the spider up at the top left, things like nadarians represented by that jellyfish on the far left, things like chordates like us, like represented by the flamingo right above me, mollusks represented by that octopus. There are tons and tons and tons of vertebrate phyla. And I wanted you guys to take a second. You can pause the video if you want. Look at this slide. This is a lot of different images of a lot of different representatives of different phyla on earth and make some observations about what they look like and um, what you notice about them. So I'm gonna encourage you actually to pause the video for a second um, and think about that. All right, well, here's hoping you paused and at least uh, spent a little bit of time looking at this thing. So I usually show this slide to intro bio students and ask them to make some observations. And almost invariably what I hear back is, there's a lot of worms. <laughs> and that's true, right? It seems like the basic condition for most of the phyla in earth history of animals is sort of this wormy shape, a tubey thing with its senses up front, moving around. Also, people notice that it's a lot of water. How about that? If you look at all the different phyla on earth, almost every single one of them, the default is it's an ocean organism. This is all like interesting lines of evidence for like where we would expect to see the evolution of animals. And of course, all of the evidence really points to an ocean origin for animals, just like it points to an ocean origin for eukarya, an ocean origin for life. Life evolved in the oceans, mostly stayed in the oceans. Most of the big picture biodiversity on earth is still in the oceans. Evolving to come up onto land is kind of the odd thing to do. Although, of course, if you do come up on land, you can be really successful. A lot of interesting things to talk about, and we're going to get into this again more next week. Here are modern phyla put across a phylogeny. So look how they are related to one another. We are represented on this phylogeny, as all the vertebrates are, uh, by a magpie, by a bird. A bird is a dinosaur. Anyway, that magpie is up there representing you and me and everything else that's a vertebrate. 
These are the relationships amongst the phyla. For a long time, this was controversial because all we had to go on were things like anatomy and fossils. Now we have DNA and we can be really, really, really confident. Although there's some questions still about a couple of little nodes, but for the most part, we can be super confident. This is the tree of life. This is how the phyla of animals are all related to one another. And so we can put on this tree a lot of helpful taxa to help us understand the evolution. So here's the common ancestor of all animals. That node is called animalia. All of these things, sponges, jellies, starfish, all the way over to the octopus. These are all animals. There's other clades here that are really important. So bilateria. We're going to talk about bilateria here in a second. <clears throat> Deuterostomia and protostomia. We're going to talk about those here in a second. These are clades within bilateria. Some animals are related to us more than others, right? It might surprise you to see a starfish so close to us vertebrates as opposed to something like an insect or an octopus, but that's the truth. When I see an animal phylogeny, like a phylogeny at the scale of all of Animalia, I can't help myself. The only thing I really think of the first time I see it is something like this. Oh, sorry. There's a couple more clades that uh, when we're talking about animal biodiversity are important. Ike Dysozoa is one, Lophotrochozoa, which is very fun to say. Um, is another. Anyway, when I see this giant phylogeny of animals, always what I first think of is this. <laughs> I usually think like, I'm not some big SpongeBob fan, but I do think like the animal diversity on SpongeBob's pretty impressive for a popular TV show. Anyway, there's all the clades. Okay. Once we get into this animal evolution, we can start really talking about vertebrates and where vertebrates came from. And so we can put phylogeny on, sorry, on the phylogeny, we can put synapomorphies. And so here's multicellularity. Animals inherited a multicellular condition from a common ancestor, and they all have it. Sponges, magpies, octopuses, multicellularity is the default condition, the ancestral condition for animalia. Here's some more phylogeny, or sorry, some more synapomorphies, though, some more derived characters for our phylogeny. We're going to talk a lot more about these things next week. So you can see things like jellies and bilaterians share features to the exclusion of sponges. When there are embryos, there are two tissue layers, an ectoderm on the outside of the body and an endoderm on the inside of the body. That endoderm is lining uh, kind of the digestive cavity in most of these early animals. All these animals also share neurons. So actual cells that are explicitly controlling muscle movement by electrical signals. Sponges don't have neurons. Jellies have pretty simple neurons. And of course, we all have neurons up higher in the animal tree, or I shouldn't say higher, further into uh, to diversification of animals. So neurons, an ectoderm and an endoderm, those are synapomorphies for that clade of jellies plus bilaterians. Bilaterians have tons of features that unite them to the exclusion of animals like jellies and sponges. They're bilaterally symmetrical and they have heads. That's what encephalization means. We're going to talk about that in a second. They're also triploblastic. So instead of just having an ectoderm when they're embryos, meaning an outer layer of cells and an endoderm, meaning a gut lining inner layer of cells, there is a mesoderm. That mesoderm is a really big deal. And it's one of the reasons uh, bilaterians are so diverse in their body plants. We're going to talk about that. There's an internal body cavity inside all bilaterians. So a coelom, a place where it's where you keep all of your organs. So instead of just your outer body and your gut tube, there's a space in between where you can have other things happening. Um, you don't just have a simple, like kind of like osmotic cavity where you can like absorb nutrients. You have a digestive tract that has different parts to it that break down food and extract nutrients in different ways. Also, all bilaterians have what we'd call a CNS, a central nervous system. It might not look like yours in all of its details, but the idea that there's a central kind of brain type structure, or at least ganglia, and then cords that connect those things that run through the body in the similar kinds of ways. That's ancestral for all bilaterians. So an octopus's brain and a um, damselfly's brain and a magpie's brain or your brain, they are in their details extremely derived and not similar. But the ancestral CNS is something that is shared by all bilaterians. That's really cool. So here's just some of those things uh, shown so you know what I'm talking about. So those early, uh, earlier diverging animals, things like sponges and um, jellies and corals, they have what we call radial symmetry, whereas most of the bilaterians, by definition almost, can be bilaterally cut. They are symmetrical side to side. So there's an owl and a lobster showing you what bilateral symmetry is. 
Here's a nice earthworm. So this is an annelid, also a bilaterian, just like you. It has an outer body covering from ectoderm, an inner gut tube with a, it's really a digestive tract in a bilaterian, lined by endoderm. And then that red is showing you the mesoderm. And so you can see within that red mesoderm, there's cavities on either side. And those cavities themselves are their own character called a coelom. And that's where there can be organs. And for you, that's things like lungs and kidneys and heart, all these things that are outside the digestive tract that help you operate. One thing that I think is really fun and goes back to that uh, slide you saw of all the phyla of, anim of animal diversity that are alive right now, worm is the default condition. And in fact, if you start, especially from a developmental biology perspective, your understanding of anatomy, even in vertebrates, as the idea of a tube-like organism with senses at the front and then a tube that goes through its body that's its digestive tract that has a mouth at the front and an anus at the back. All these animals are a tube within a tube. And if you take yourself and consider yourself a tube within a tube with a bunch of fancy accessories, a lot of it could actually be explained in a pretty fun way. I always like to use this picture of a leech, which is a kind of annelid worm, eating an earthworm, which is a different kind of annelid worm, because that's a tube within a tube within a tube within a tube. And I think that's funny. Here's a cool example, I think, of the deep homology, not in detail, but in like developmental presence of like a brain and central nervous system between a vertebrate. So that dog has a brain that then has a dorsal running nerve cord. Uh, whereas in things like arthropods, which are on the other side of bilateria, the um, protostome side of bilateria, there's still like a central thing in the head that we could call a brain with ganglia on the bottom, but they run along the ventral, the bottom surface, the lower surface of the organism. There's still a deep homology there, but obviously they function uh, in slightly different ways, but it's still very, very cool. We don't think about ourselves uh, when we're comparing with animal uh, anatomy to things like arthropods and annelids, but it's absolutely valid. So here's our summary slide for the Proterozoic era. Again, there's no vertebrates here, so we're really still building till this class like officially starting. From 2.5 billion years ago to 0.539 billion years ago, or now I'm going to switch over to 539 million years ago, that's that Proterozoic eon. Great oxygenation happens at the beginning. We get our first snowball Earth. Eukaryotes evolve, which means there's endosymbiosis, more size and complexity among single cell organisms, sexual reproduction, which is super important to uh, natural selection, providing more fodder, more diversity for selection to act upon. Um, hilariously, there's a billion years that everybody thinks apparently is really boring, where there's just eukaryotes diversifying and oxygen staying pretty steady. But as we go into the cryogenian, more snowball Earths, a switch on who are the dominant photosynthesizers. And I didn't say it when we were talking earlier, but besides the oxygenation of the deep oceans, oxygen in the atmosphere is also really increasing as these eukaryotes start taking over the dominant photosynthesizing role. There's still bacteria doing it, but eukaryotes are doing it. And there's even more oxygen in the atmosphere. And then of course, by the Ediacaran period, most of the animal phyla are able to be inferred to be present. We're gonna talk a lot more about that next week, but there's fossils of good record for things like sponges, things like nadarians, maybe even things like mollusks. We have plenty of molecular, meaning DNA, reasons to expect almost all the other phyla are present in the diacrin, but we're not finding them yet as fossils. A theme for what we're going to talk about when we get to the Cambrian is most of these organisms don't have hard parts yet, things like shells or bone or teeth, something like that. And so therefore, they don't really make very good fossils. It's hard to find them. And that's a really interesting pattern that really affects how we think about Earth history. So that's the Proterozoic. If we put the Hadean, the Archean, and the Proterozoic together, if you run the numbers, that's 88% of Earth's history. And so that's after, <clears throat> excuse me, already, you know, 9 billion years of universe history before the Earth actually forms. And so <laughs> when we talk about the whole part of this class, all the many, many millions of years we're going to get into in this class, it's all the Phanerozoic. It's the last... Ooh, 12% of Earth's history is really when we have a really great fossil record and a bunch of really cool things to talk about. Um, but I really wanted you guys to have this deep handle on where things are coming from and how it actually all blends together. And so uh, here's your summary for the Archean. If you need it again, feel free to pause and take it. And here's your summary for the Hadean. I'll go back to that Proterozoic. Pieces of Earth history that I think are important ultimately to the vertebrate story. Um, and I can't wait to get started with you guys soon on really vertebrate evolution. All right, I'll see you next week.